What's up everybody out there in YouTube land? Wrath 2501 here. Alright guys, so this is kind of like delayed spooky month stuff. Uh, this is what if famous horror characters were Marvel superheroes. And this is part two by uh, Pop Cross Studios. I love this guy's shit. The stories he puts together are awesome. He, this guy should definitely be producing his own comics, I swear. Anyway, let's get started here and... Go. monstery versions of cute kinds of characters. I think I might have even more so enjoyed rewriting the <laughs> That's just like a realistic Barney characters to make them more positive or heroic, like I did a couple weeks ago in famous horror movie characters as Marvel superheroes. That realization paired with lots of great suggestions from all of you mm. in the comments about what other horror movie characters I could use has prompted a sequel for today. So let's I don't think it, Predators are really a horror movie though. Hit like if you want. Subscribe. If you feel like, kind of sci fi horror, I guess. Enjoy the show. Frederick Krueger led a simple life as the janitor of a high school in Hell's Kitchen. He was friendly with all the teachers and children, and there were never any Bullshit. complaints about him or his work ethic. But people can turn on you very quickly when they're told a convincing lie. While working a night shift, Frederick heard a commotion outside the school. He went to the window to see three men rushing into the alley next to him, dragging the body of a local student. Frederick crouched to stay hidden, but picked up from the three men's conversation that they'd been selling drugs to the students, and promptly after taking them, this boy had had a seizure, and they were trying to wake him up. Oh, shit. No That's dark, dead. man. That is real they dark. They then talked about all the other it's students really they had sold that to happens. that day, like, and how the lot. batch they'd been distributing might have been tainted. Frederick tried to sneakily turn on his phone to record the conversation, but pressed the photo button in his nervous state and the camera flashed, alerting the men to his presence. Oh my God, he dropped his ass. phone in the scramble as the three men broke into the school to try and chase him down. Frederick managed to escape, but his troubles were far from over. Having taken his phone and found out who it was that had seen them, these men relayed the problem to their boss. And quickly, New York's kingpin of crime had his people on correcting the uh. issue. Four other students had died from those drugs, and all the deaths were blamed on Frederick. Kingpin's people threatened other students' families to claim that Frederick had tried to sell them drugs as well. He was arrested, and while he couldn't afford an expensive lawyer, a compassionate, altruistic man named Matthew Murdoch was willing to take <laughs> on his case, believing him to be innocent. Murdoch was able to convince the courts that there was far from sufficient evidence to put Frederick away, but the judge and jury being convinced didn't mean the parents with lost children were as well. Mm. Losing a child can drive a person to a very dark place. Madness. A group of parents soon after created a small mob and hunted down Frederick as he worked one night. Still convinced his actions had led to the death of their children, they trapped him in the boiler room of the school and set it ablaze. Matt Murdock, in his nightly Dude, attire that as blown the vigilante the daredevil, had been silently checking in on Frederick since the case had closed, and arrived well after the parents had left. He busted down the door to the boiler room and dragged Frederick out, but by that time his entire body was badly burned. He Eesh. spent the night in a hospital bed, slipping farther and farther towards death. But right as he was on the brink, he seemed to awaken in a haze of green smoke and hovering stones. Soon, a man with pale skin and an eerie grin wandered into view. This was Nightmare, a demon who came to him with a deal. He knew of the circumstances of Frederick's death and wanted to give him an opportunity to get revenge on those who'd framed him and the parents who'd killed him. Nightmare would grant Frederick the ability to invade the dreams of the living with essentially godlike power to torment them. Mm. He wouldn't be able to cause them genuine physical harm, but Nightmare fed on the terror humans experienced in the night, and he believed no, Frederick so this is definitely could watered be a perfect down new Freddy tool in bringing him more darkness to consume. Frederick agreed, still enraged at all that had happened to him. Nightmare's only warning was to never be in contact with one of his victims when they awoke, or he could be dragged back into the real world, where he'd no longer be invulnerable and have his full abilities. He'd be stuck in whatever state he'd been in before being dragged out. The first person whose dream he dove into was that of a girl named Nancy, who'd been one of the students to claim he'd tried to sell her drugs. But upon entering her dream, he saw that she was already having a terrible nightmare. It was blended with the real-world events of Kingpin's men 
threatening her family, and even revealed to him that her family had long since been under the thumb of Wilson Fisk, as her father had been forced to pay protection money to Kingpin's men for years to continue running his shop in Hell's Kitchen. This halted Frederick's lust for revenge. Visiting dreams of others who'd participated in his death showed him that they'd all just been terrified or manipulated by a situation that was ultimately the fault of Fisk and his men. Yeah. And so, Frederick's aim changed. Somebody go that even King can couldn't fight against appearing them. as a superhero, resembling elements of real-world heroes he was familiar with. He'd first save these people from their nightmares. Then, he'd arm himself in a super suit and have them bring him out of their dreams, temporarily back into the real world, where he'd use his weaponry to apprehend or kill Fisk's men. This would end up putting him at odds with his own ex-lawyer, Murdoch, who was strongly opposed to killing in any form. And, of course, Nightmare oh, well. would be furious with Frederick for acting in direct violation of their agreement. But all the challenges he'd face would not turn Frederick from his new goal to take down Fisk's operations, aided one at a time by the Kingpin's victims. Hmm. Uh, this is kind of like one of the flimsy ones. This was not a good choice for making into a superhero. The, po the powers are just kind of like... When Carrie yeah. White turned 13 and her mutant oh, abilities shit. started to manifest, her okay, mother yeah. could not have been more horrified. Margaret White believed mutants were an abomination sent by the devil to overthrow God's true children. Oh, God, because of this, man. Carrie was forbidden to use her powers, and she only ever caught slight glimpses of what she could truly do. She was telekinetic, able to move things with her mind. But any time she did, too. even accidentally, her mother would lock her in a closet and force her to pray for hours on end to God to remove her demonic abilities. On top of being an apparent affront to God, her mother claimed that if she ever used her powers in public, people would be after her, looking to string her up. Her small town had never seen a mutant up close before, and Carrie knew there was likely truth in what her mother was saying. Yeah, that's Carrie true. Carrie went through high school terrified of her powers that's manifesting true, further, and buried her desires to use them, even being convinced herself that these were simply voices in her head sent by the devil to trick her. Her school life wasn't much better than her home life. She was afraid to try and make friends and spent much of her time as a loner. Her mother forced her to wear very old-fashioned clothing that students often remarked looked as though they'd been dug out of the trash. One day, in response to this, a particularly yeah, unpleasant girl psycho. at school named Chris Harginson filled Carrie's locker with garbage that dumped over her when she opened it. Chris Asshole. and her friends nearby laughed emphatically and quickly made it clear that they'd perpetrated the act to the applause of other students. Pricks. That was the first time yeah, that's Carrie high lost school, control though. Assholes. in the Kids are assholes. Her hey, eyes kids. flashed red and all the garbage hurled off the ground and splattered onto Chris. It was satisfying for her, but immediately yeah. after doing this, fear fired through Carrie. She was terrified and could already see in her mind all the students trying to kill her for being a mutant, as her mother had so claimed they would. She ran from the scene, but couldn't escape the call home to her mother. Chris had been banned oh, from attending the prom for her cruel prank, and Carrie avoided getting in any serious trouble for her response, but her mother still locked her in a closet for the entire weekend to repent. Jeez. She was let out on Sunday night as a visitor came to the white residence looking for Carrie. The woman with a thick southern drawl introduced herself as Anna Marie, though often the public referred to her as Rogue. Mm. She said she was from Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters, where they oh, used a I'm device sure called Cerebro well. to stay it's on just watch like the camp counselor Jason, well Jason to come Carey. to develop their gifts with others like them. Of course, Carrie's mother claimed this school must be a satanic cult and told Rogue to leave her home immediately. Rogue did as instructed, but left Carrie a number to call and promised her that even if she didn't come to Xavier's, to always remember that most people are not as afraid of mutants as she'd been led to believe. Most people would accept her as she was. Eh, Margaret, of course, spent the evening thing. convincing Carrie that the opposite was true. And so, upon her return to school on Monday, Carrie was horrified that her fellow students would come after her and could feel leering looks the entire day. But before so she was out, one of the more popular the hell, boys dude? from her grade, Tommy, who she'd always thought was very attractive, asked her to go with him to the prom. He said he thought it was cool that she was a mutant, and how she'd reacted to Chris's prank was great. It was almost too good for Carrie to believe. 
Her mother, mm. of course, tried to convince her that this was all another prank, that the students who'd seen her use her abilities were just looking to further torment her for being a Oh mutant. god, he's giving her but red Carrie eyes, what the her, fuck, dude? made herself a beautiful dress, and went to the prom. The night was magical, the best of her life, and approaching its end, it seemed to get that much better, as she oh, and Tommy were voted boy. prom king and queen. Carrie thought it all had to be too good to be true. And it was. And she was almost proven right. Through the clapping of the crowd, Chris Harginson, who wasn't supposed to be on the premises at all, stepped out Jeez. holding a rope and yelled, Let's make your dress match your mutant freak eyes. She tugged and released a bucket of blood above Carrie. Carrie looked up just in time and used her powers to stop the blood in midair. But in doing so, she realized she'd be drawing even more attention to her powers in front of the entire school. She panicked and let the blood drop and it splattered all over her. But even still, they'd all just seen her using her powers. Yeah. Images flashed Should've through her mind with the, the whole crowd getting up in arms trying to burn the mutant freak. Rage and the need to defend herself started to bubble in Carrie's mind. But she let Rogue's words ring through. A reminder that not everyone would be so afraid of her as she'd been convinced. The dark fantasy of students coming after her faded and she could see that the reality was the majority of students were booing Chris for her actions. Tommy was immediately trying to console hmm. Carrie and swearing that he had nothing to do yeah. with what just happened. Nobody in sight It's very similar to the camp counselor of Jason's story. If not for Rogue's message, Carrie could see a dark alternate version of herself going on a rampage through her school in response. Yeah. And so Killing she was everyone. convinced that day to make the call. She wouldn't become a full-time student at Xavier's, but would attend during the summers. She wanted to develop her gifts, but also wanted a foot in the real world, learning to see the good and acceptance in the majority of people around her, as well as to thicken her skin when she did come across more people like Chris. Carrie would become a fantastically Bitch. powerful, occasional member of Xavier's school, all the while growing more confident and self-loving, and even helping her mother to see that mutants were God's children too, and that her powers were uh, not something good luck to with fear. That. That's a much happier ending. <laughs> this one is an obvious choice, though, to try to make a superhero out of. This one's a pretty obvious choice. Priya, that so was are, part yeah, of the I most that powerful one. races well, of I see it, but, yeah. all the galaxy. But he wasn't exactly living in line with his people's ways. The Ayutja had many rites it's of passage Yaucha, that dude. demanded Yaucha. their young seek out dangerous prey to hunt across the galaxy. But when this demand led to the death of Priyadat's father at the hands of a burly Austrian-sounding American man on Earth, <laughs> Priyadat began to <laughs> resent his own people's ways. He eventually abandoned his nice people tie in. I love it, man. I love it. to compete in their fighting arenas. He'd tried to return once to visit his home, but had been turned away and threatened with execution for ignoring his people's ways, and he was labeled with the title of Bad Blood, reserved yeah. for the Aoudra criminals. Yeah, he they would have done that. He didn't care, but it did sting having his own people refuse his return. To drown his sorrows, he spent his time partying and gambling away all the credits that he earned from his fights and from the occasional bounty hunting mission he took on. His fame in the ring, paired with his pristine bounty hunting record, eventually led to a Cree accuser, called Ripley, approaching him with a task. Oh. She claimed that a dangerous Cree experiment, called a Xenorph, had escaped on her watch, and that she had other duties to attend to, and needed a hunter to handle the situation quickly and quietly. She told Priya that the experiment had been taken already did. by the Pretty Guardians nice. of the Galaxy, and that Priyodat would likely have to get through them all to reach his target and slay it. Priyodat was up for the challenge after being offered a significant sum for the task. With the ship and the tech that he'd taken with him when leaving his own homeworld, Priyodat tracked down the Guardians of the Galaxy. He found them on Nowhere, and could have dispatched with them silently, one at a time, as a tactical member of his species would have. But spending so much time in the spotlight of the arena had changed his combat style. He marched right up to them and punched the largest of them, Drax the Destroyer, yeah. right in the jaw, beginning a lengthy brawl with the group. Priodat's biological advantages paired with his practice in the fighting rings showed, and he slowly but surely whittled away the Guardians, though thankfully not killing any of them, before getting to his target. 
a young alien woman with an extended head and bladed tail. She proved to be a much more even match for him, evading all his weapons and landing many blows of her own. Even when he managed to slice through her side, her blood melted his wrist blades and left him a weapon down. Still, he eventually managed to get her pinned with her own tail held to her throat. As he was about to complete his mission, she said, I refuse to die until I've saved my people. That gave Priodat pause. This target was just supposed to be an experiment gone wrong. He pressed her for more information, and she told him that her people had originally been the result of Kree experimentation, but that they'd been living in peace and told on the fuck off for hundreds of years, before Ripley the Accuser found them and slaughtered the majority of them, then took the remaining few back to the Kree homeworld for more experimentation. This woman was Eloise, daughter of the once queen of her people. She'd <laughs> sworn to save her people, and the Guardians had no agreed relation. to help her. Upon learning all of this, Priodat released her. His own people may have rejected him, but perhaps this was an opportunity for at least some form of redemption. He too then agreed to help her, and despite a rocky first encounter, Priodat and Eloise became fast friends. Not long later, they would manage to save her people, and then they'd <laughs> become more than friends, and Wait, someday what? their own Bruh. child would become a founding member of the next generation of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Bruh, okay, you're taking that a little bit too far with that fanfiction. That's creepy as fuck. <laughs> When Mike was a boy, oh. his parents had a hard time raising him. He was non-communicative. Not only could well, he I mean, not if you're gonna speak, do but Jason, they could hardly even well. get him to nod or Jason, shake his Freddy, head in well response to the things they asked. It was hard going for them, but they did their best. Until the night of the incident. When he was six years old, Mike's parents had gone to the movies and left him and his older sister, Judith, at home with a babysitter. A young woman who was new to town, named Lori. They returned a horrible scene of Lori screaming, running from the house, claiming that Mike had just killed his sister with a kitchen knife. The parents ran inside and found Mike standing petrified next to his sister's lifeless, bloody body. Because of his inability to communicate, Mike was unable to tell them that Lori had in fact killed Judith, and done so with an evil grin on her face. Jeez. When Mike came <laughs> to see what was going on, she then stabbed him in the throat. But the wound immediately healed. She tried again and again, but every time she sliced him, he'd heal as the blade left his body. She was about ready to panic. Lori had been on a killing spree through several towns, being dubbed by the media the Sitter Slayer, but never had she come across a complication like this, <laughs> though she quickly found a solution. All through her attempted assault on him, Mike had just been staring down at his sister in shock. So, Lori cut a gash into her own arm, then grabbed Mike's hand and forced the knife into it. He just continued to stand there, staring down at his sister, wielding the knife, and so she waited until his parents returned. With Lori's manipulation successful, Mike was believed to be the killer, and taken to a sanatorium where they made hmm. little progress in helping him or getting any information out of him. As they discovered his invulnerability, he was eventually transferred to Ravencroft Institute, which specialized in superhuman criminals, in the hope that they'd have the resources to contain him if his powers grew further. By the time he was in his early 20s, many had just accepted that he'd essentially remain institutionalized for life. But when a man named Cletus Cassidy was locked up oh. in the same cell block, that would set in oh, motion the means for his freedom. Cassidy was better known to the world as the symbiote-enhanced murderer Carnage, and not long after his yeah. arrest, an ally of Carnage would break in with a fragment of his symbiote to help him escape. Mike would see the ally go past his cell and immediately recognize her as Lori. She'd aged and changed her hair, but he knew it was her. Oh. Lori freed Carnage and the symbiote serial killer tore through all the cages, releasing all of the inmates. Mike saw many of the most cruel and maniacal villains that he'd been locked away with for so long escaping and was finally stirred into action. At a slow, lumbering pace, he marched through the crowds of fleeing villains and fought them all, hitting hard enough to knock many Damn. of them unconscious in one blow. Yeah, he he lurched on strong. after Lori, but she was moving too fast and was out the door in a car before Mike could catch her. Luckily, 
he had another power laying dormant that he could only finally use once he stepped out of sight of any people or security cameras. Teleport! As long as nobody was looking at him, he could teleport. I knew it! He ported oh, himself behind damn. a tree down the road yes. ahead of Lori and Carnage who were escaping together nice. and stepped out into the street. Awesome. They tried to just mow him down in the car, but upon being struck, he clung to the hood and tried to pull himself up into the vehicle. They screeched yeah, to the that would have been and like tried a horror to kill Mike, right there. but every blow healed instantly. Upon seeing this, Lori realized just who this was, and she <laughs> got back in the car to flee once more. But Mike wouldn't leave her be this time. Few fully understand his motives, or why exactly the breakout finally stirred him to take up arms against criminals. But after that night, Mike donned a cloak and super suit, and hunted down Lori and suit. every other villain who exactly escaped super suit. from Ravencroft. He may not be able to traditionally communicate, but his actions clearly show that this mysterious superhuman only wants to protect people from the still cues as a kitchen this knife. world. Okay, this one was imaginative. Okay, this was a good one. In terms of story building, the design is pretty good. It's pretty basic, actually. But uh, but still good, still serviceable. Well, I'd say round but, two uh, wins out over round one for me. But the, but uh, the story is really, down. really good for that channel one. If you haven't seen the previous episode, I'll link it in the cards. Recommend going okay, that's back fucked to it. Up, or you man. might also like wow. my recent famous video game oh, characters yeah, if was... they were on the Suicide Squad episode. And by all means, <laughs> leave me more suggestions for characters Dude. I could use if this ends up getting Doom Slayer oh, is that, not that's on the Suicide Squad. Anybody going up against the Doom Slayer is committing suicide. thought I want to leave people with today is a really nice, simple one that I read this week. A quote by someone named Dan Mace who says that worrying is a misuse of your imagination. Simple, hmm. hard hitting, and great. I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you so much for watching everybody. I love you all. That's and I'll see you all in the next episode on there. Friday. Goodbye. Okay, so that was famous horror characters as Marvel superheroes. That one was good. That was good. The Freddy one was the was like not impressive. The design was eh and the story just, it just doesn't fit. It was way too much of a manipulation of the original character. The story for, for Michael Myers, that was great. That one was awesome. Carrie, that's, e that's an easy one. You know, just tweaking the story a bit. And the design was actually pretty good. It was like a variation of her prom dress or something like that. Pretty, not bad. All right, guys. Uh... <laughs> uh, like this video and subscribe. Uh, let me know in the comments which one you guys liked. Or if you, uh, you know, liked any of them or didn't. Uh, I still say this guy deserves to have a com some comic series. I swear, he's awesome. <sighs> anyway, so definitely click on the link to the original in the description. Like and subscribe over at Pop Cross, And I will see you guys next time. Tune in every day for new content. Bye-bye.